So imagine, it's late at night, what are you doing? You're surfing reverb. You click on your feed. You start scrolling through some stuff, and then you see the strangest Lost Paul you've ever seen. This is what happened to me a few days ago. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. I love guitars that have a story and have been modified and are pretty old. This has all of that and more. So when this thing was first listed, it was listed as a 1968 Gibson Les Paul Custom. And it was for $12,000 and the listing got suspended within like 20 minutes because this was the only photo. They were saying it's this really rare, vintage, valuable guitar. Doesn't disclose any of the modifications that have clearly been done to this. So it didn't surprise me that the listing got pulled down. So I thought I'd do some research on the seller. Dawn Shop. Okay. It was a new account, but did not seem scammy at all, so I thought I'd reach out to her and see if she needed some help properly identifying this guitar. Because A, I wanted to help her out because I thought the guitar was cool, and B, I thought it'd make for a great episode, which you're watching right now. So I tried to give her some pointers on the shots that would really help us identify this guitar. I had this old buckethead listing. It's always important to take a look at the truss rod in a guitar, because that can help you actually date it and to see how much life is left in the rod itself. Pickups and pickup cavities are ridiculously important, especially in trying to identify a 1968 Les Paul. Because you gotta remember, at this point in time, I only had a photo that looks similar to this but with worse lighting, and something that showed us the back. Not a lot to go off of. Out of all the pickup cavities, the most important one to get a photo shot of is actually the neck, because that'll tell us what type of a tenon we have, which can help us find out if it's a true 68 or not. And looking in the control cavity never hurt anybody, and it's super easy to do. Even a person that has no idea how to take a guitar apart can take out four screws on the back. Now taking the strings off or loosening them and then taking these screws out to look in here, yeah, sometimes that's asking a bit much. And then I was just asking her for some general photos, so these were just to give her an idea. But then she produced these photos for us, which we can now see on her public listing. And I was really excited when she sent me these photos, because I really, really wanted it to be a 68 Les Paul Custom that was factory custom ordered like this. I mean, what do we even have going on here? I view this as like a sun, so it's like, I'm gonna play Here Comes the Sun on this guitar. But then you look at your fretboard, it's like a vine inlay. You've got some leaves on it, the rest is just a vine or a branch as I was saying, but it's completely bound and there's no evidence of any other type of inlays on here. So that likely means the entire fretboard has been replaced on this guitar or it was a custom order. If this is truly a late 60s Les Paul, natural was not a color they did back then. It was just pure ebony at this time. But on top of this unique finish, we've got a TP6 tailpiece. Okay, that was introduced in the late 70s. It's still used in current day production if you want to custom order it. They don't use it too often, but you can still buy them. But then we have some sort of a wide travel bridge. Now it looks like that's completely made out of brass, and brass was a big thing in the late 70s, early 80s. That's why sometimes you'll find brass nuts stock on guitars in that time period, and some people still swear by it, giving you better tone and sustain yet today. So that makes me think this was likely replaced in the late 70s, early 80s. And to further solidify that, take a look at these knobs. Those are the prehistoric reissue knobs that you'll find from, you know, roughly 82 to 85-ish. So that means if this thing has been modified and it's not a factory original, it was likely modified in the early to mid 80s. Either that or these were just old parts at that point in time when it was done in the late 80s. <laughs> it's kind of hard to tell when something was particularly done. But now we got to look at these pickups. I think it's safe to say they're not the original T-tops that should be in here, right? We've got some sort of a rail pickup, maybe a Bill Lawrence design. He was popular around the time that these parts were being made. Heck, he was actually still part of Gibson at that point in time. So, it's been heavily modified. There's nothing original left on this guitar so far that we can see. We're missing our toggle switch tip, but it looks like the switch itself is just fine. Maybe this plastic part is still original, maybe not. It's not looking so good for the pickup rings though. Those are definitely custom for these pickups. The pick guard just might be original though. So next up, we can take a look at the back. Okay, it looks like it was actually played pretty heavily. We've got some buckle rash back here. If you're ever curious, what's the difference between buckle rash and buckle worming? This 
right here is worming. It's when it leaves a line in it, like a worm is eating through the wood. But rash is when it actually goes through the finish, like in this area. So this has worming and rash, but just because you have worming does not necessarily mean you have a rash. <laughs> yeah, just some fun terminology for you. So it's clearly been used, but we can also see in this photo, okay, one, two, three piece neck. Okay, so that automatically rules out 1968. It just can't be a 68 with a three piece neck. Unless it's like a really freaky, very, 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 very late 68. But the reason why 68s are worth so much more than a 69 or a 70 or later simply comes down to the specs. They were closer to 50 spec. On the standards, you had small head stocks, you had one piece necks, one piece bodies, which leads us to our next point here. This is a pancake body construction. So that definitely rules out 1968 without a doubt. It still has a fighting chance to be a 69, but it cannot be a 68. But it looks like there's also been some custom artwork done along the edge of the guitar. That's the first time I've seen that. It kind of reminds me of the design that sometimes you see on the backside of an acoustic guitar that runs up and down the middle. I think it kind of looks nice with the sandwich body there. It just kind of breaks up the other mahogany pieces. Okay, so 69 or later at this point, and then the headstock. Yep, that's late 69, early 70. That's just what that headstock logo means. It's a very characteristic logo that's very blocky and did not live too long. Now, I don't think it's the Pantacraft version that'll start to peel off. It might be, though, because at this point in time, it seems like this whole guitar was refinished, so they might have done it, and that's why it hasn't flaked off yet. Sometimes that'll happen. You can check out my Les Paul professional video about that. Seeing this headstock was actually a real breath of fresh air because... I'll be honest with you guys, when I saw this, I thought for sure, ah, this person just has like one of those lawsuit era guitars that somebody has modified or it had some crazy factory stuff going on. So seeing this headstock in this way made me really excited for her. She does have something incredibly valuable. Not quite as valuable as the 68, but still has considerable value, even though it's been heavily modified. But the last photo we have to help us ID this is this one. So we can see it's got a giant volute. So that makes me think more so that this is a 1970 because in 69, that's when they started the volute and generally they're not gigantic. They're just small little bumps. Like sometimes you can even miss them, but as the year and years progress, they just get larger and larger. I mean, take a look at this giant Kalamazoo from 1979 Les Paul volute. But something else we can see here is the original waffle back tuners. You can see evidence of that being originally on here. Those are really cool tuners, but as they age, they are just not very good. But you can see we have made in West Germany Schaller tuners. So that lines up perfectly with all this other stuff, late 70s, early 80s. These are the tuners that Gibson used for a good 10 years, from about the mid 70s to the mid 80s before they started toying back with Grovers. There's some high end arch tops that still get these even yet today though. But the other thing that's very important to take a look at is your serial number. Now serial numbers, they don't tell us much in this era. I mean, you can kind of use them, but if you plug them into the guitar data website, no, you're not going to get any type of accurate information for this period of time. Because it wasn't until 1977 when they introduced the year, day, 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 year, production number. These are just random numbers essentially. So 915 looks like maybe 812. But what's important here is you can see the original black finish still within the serial number. So that 100% without a doubt tells me this was refinished at one point in time. I don't know when, I mean likely when all this other stuff was done but it would have originally started life like this. A 1970 Les Paul Custom Black Beauty. This one's actually currently for sale on G-Base. You can just look it up by 1970. So it would have originally had the witch hat knobs with the thumb bleeders. It would have an ABR-1 bridge with nylon saddles with a regular tailpiece here, none of the TP6 stuff. It would have patent number T-top pickups, ebony finish, and would have had those really low fretless wonder style frets. So the fact that the fretboard's been replaced on this one and it's got the slightly taller frets, at least the way that it looks like in the photos, that might actually be a benefit for somebody. But the back would have looked just like this. You would have a neck that's completely covered over so you wouldn't even know how many pieces it is. And there's that really goofy characteristic period of time Gibson headstock. This is an exact match for the one that Dawn has. And here you can even see the original Klusen Waffle Back tuners I was just talking about, and a kind of similar volute on this one. 
So this one is listed today at $12,500. Some people might call that guy crazy. So let's see what else is currently on the market. Well, there's one for 13, one for 14 and a half, one for 12. Who's right? Who's crazy? It's so hard to tell anymore. Generally, the 68s, they're worth the most than the 69, and then it goes down each and every single year. I do believe the true reason why all these are priced so differently really comes down to condition, because condition is everything on these as well as specs. So that's the one we were just looking at on G-Base. But what's going on on this one for 8,500? Well, it's got the same blocky logo, but it's got some modifications. So it looks like that's what makes this one a little bit less valuable. I mean, the condition kind of similar to what we have over here. So I was trying to help her nail down a price on this. I was going to do it for my video anyways. I thought I'd send her a message about it as well. So unfortunately, 12000 is just out the window. I'm sure $12,000 would take this one home. And that is a pretty darn clean example in all original shape. So typically, refinished vintage guitars are devalued between 30 and 50%. It depends what kind of finish you put on it. Did it look good? Is it a garbage refinish? Unfortunately, this one falls under the garbage refinish because who really wants a sun Les Paul? I mean, there's sun burst and then there's sun burst. <laughs> I kind of like it now for that. But most people, if they were going to refinish a 1970 Les Paul Custom, they wouldn't choose this. They would probably have this redone in black again. Unless there was an interesting story behind this. But unfortunately, when I asked the seller about it, she didn't have one. So I would personally put this one in the 50% devaluation category. Now, in my opinion, you don't really go any further for other modifications unless maybe there's a headstock break that you need to consider. But this one, it appears to actually be solid. We've got some finish checking. It's clearly an old refinish. But the other parts, honestly, I don't care. We don't have enough photos to really judge how well the fretboard was replaced or even if it was. I mean, I'm pretty confident the finish is an original, but who's to say that he didn't custom order it with that crazy fretboard on it? If that was the case, that would drastically affect the price because then collectors would be interested in it because it'd be a factory ordered one off custom. But the odds of that in this situation, I think are very low. So due to the fact that it just, it's not traditional. Most people aren't going to want to purchase this unless they're a quirky guitar collector but usually those guys want a cool story. And the only story I was able to get is that her father purchased this right after she was born. And despite all my advice I gave to her here, she didn't really want to believe me that it probably wasn't the 68. And she said she never remembered it being black. But unfortunately, you have to remember the source. Sometimes stories get told and told and told so many times that the real details get lost. Like a good example is the, the Neil Sean auction. I believe it was one of his 50s Les Pauls. He like misspoke that it was a 70s one or something. So small details as far as year, like I bought this right after you were born, could mean, you know, a couple of years after. I mean, looking at the specs, I'm pretty confident it's a 1970. Looking inside the control cavity to see if the original pots were there would really be the best way to date this guitar. Because that'll tell you the guitar was made no earlier than that date. So at the end of the day, what do I think this thing is worth? Probably between four and six thousand dollars to the very right buyer because it still is a very desirable year for a Les Paul Custom. It's got a weird finish, not necessarily a complete story, but maybe she has more stories about how her dad used it in a band. I didn't really poke and pry too much. I'll leave that to somebody who's actually interested in purchasing it. But I think an offer in between that area would work. But I was telling her, you know, sometimes guitars, they have more sentimental value than they're actually worth in the market. So I don't see her getting the 12,000, unfortunately, but she should be able to get about half that. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. I'm really interested to hear your guys' thoughts and opinions on this thing. Do you think I accurately identified it? Would you rock this thing on stage? Let me know all that down in the comment section. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.